Hi, I'm Graham from Blackmagic Design. I wanted to give you a very quick update on what we'll have for NAB this year. Now, most of the new products are still a work in progress, but we'll be demonstrating them at the show, and there's a lot to talk about, so let's get started. Now, a few days ago, we launched some new Video Hub routers. Um, we couldn't really build the old ones anymore. We had some parts issues with the older models, plus we'd have to redesign the old models, uh, and it was a big change, actually, to, the, to an old design. Uh, we're already working on new models, so what we did is we focused on that instead. And there was also a lot of improvements we wanted to do in new models, if we were going to do new models. Um, we wanted a better front panel. Uh, we wanted a much nicer spin knob. We wanted better buttons, you know, buttons that could be custom labeled. Uh, so we've done that. Um, now the new models are so much nicer. There's three models in the family, as you can see here. There's a 10 by 10, a 20 by 20, and a big 40 by 40 model. Now they're all 12G SDI. They can all do, they can all do SD, HD, and Ultra HD formats on the same router at the same time. Uh, the industrial design is so much better. They have a machine metal spin knob now. It even has a clutch in it, so it stops at the end of the list. So you can use it to scroll through the inputs or the outputs. It also allows scrolling through menus, so you can change settings. Even the clutch works in the menus as well, which is really nice. Now the buttons on the front panel can be uh, have custom labels now. The button cap just pops off and you can change the label. We put some like example labels on the front, but you can change that. Now the router fascia is also polycarbonate, so it's lighter, but it's a more con uh, consistent color and texture with other Blackmagic equipment, so it matches other equipment. Even if you bought it at different times, they'll all match better in the rack. Um, you know, like switches and routers are all using the similar polycarbonate front panels now. Now we've got three models actually in the rack over here, so I, let me show you how they work. I'll just come across if you can pan over um, to here. Now what I've got in the rack here is I've got four HyperDeck Studios playing up, and they're looped up through each one of the video hubs into the top video hub here, and then the monitor one output on the top router is connected to the SmartView 4K. So let me show you quickly how to route video to the monitor. So my output is what I push first, then I can scroll to monitor one, what's already on monitor one there, and then I go to the source button, um, or the input button, and then I can scroll various sources. So when I've scrolled to deck two, now if I push take, that's all it is. I can go back and go back to one, go to three. So you can see it's all very easy. Now I can also um, use the buttons to do routing as well, and they're like shortcut buttons. So let me show you how that works. So in that case, all I do is go deck two, and then take, or deck three, take, deck four, take. So you can see how easy that is. Now you can see how much faster the buttons are. They're really nice to use. Now you might have noticed that the router was using the take button. We've also changed how that works. Um, you can now set it separately for each output. So for example, I could disable it for this monitor output, and then if you scroll the monitor sources, it would just change live. It's really good for monitoring. You don't have to push the take button all the time. You can just scroll sources. Uh, now the new models also support, support the Video Hub protocol, so any custom automation will work. And it's a text-based pro text protocol, so it's very easy to use. You can use like Telnet and learn how to use it. And also um, the router support the uh, Video Hub Master Control and the Video Hub Smart Control. Now I have a Video Hub Smart Control at the top here, so I can just push buttons to change the router output to the monitor. So this Master Control is set to output one, so I can just change the buttons there. And you can see it changes instantly, and that's actually controlling the router because it's plugged the Ethernet's plugged into it. So you can see the labels change over here as I do it. Now we also have an LCD on the front panel and it handles menus, but we can also use it for visual routing because the panel's built into the router. This is where the LCD shows live video. Um, and you can see on the 2020 router down here, you can see I've actually got the video router. Um, you can see live video. So I can scroll sources and you'll see it change. See, it's kind of cool. I've gone back to input one, so it's the same. Uh, now all the models can do visual routing, so it looks great on the big router here. Um, and you can set that in the menu between, if you want the menu display of labels or you want the visual router, and the labels are down the bottom, they're smaller. Um, so I think these are, these are great new models. I'll just go back to the other side here. Um, so the new uh, Blackmagic Video Hub 10 by 10 12G uh, model will be priced at 1395. These are all US dollars. Um, the, 20, 20, the 20 by 20 model will be priced at 2395. And the large 40 by 40 model is 3995. So that's actually um, cheaper than the old 12G model that we had. Now the prices can vary a bit based on government taxes and duties. Um, now all the uh, three models are shipping now. I think they're so much nicer than the old models. Um, I really love the spin knob with the clutch. It's just so nice to use, it's really cool. Next we have some 2110 IP video products, uh, starting with some new deck link cards. Now these are a little different because they capture and playback video to 2110 IP systems. Now they all have 10G Ethernet, and um, you can see the three models here. Um, now the first model is the Decklink IPHD model and it has the RJ45 Ethernet connection. It can record and play back three channels at the same time. So it's kind of like three cards in one. Works in 10-bit uncompressed video, so the quality is very high. 
Now it's compatible with any software that works with Declan cards, so you can run all the popular edit software. You can use all the common graphics software and also broad broadcast automation systems work. Um, these cards also work really great with DaVinci Resolve to create like a 2110 IP based editing system for broadcast. And also all the OEM solutions also just work. Uh, now there is a, uh, something I wanna talk about and it's to do with security. Um, now one of the problems we have with computers being connected to is you know rogue software or hacking. You know, if you put a computer on an IP video network, you sort of open up a lot of vulnerabilities. Um, even different governments hack each other these days. Uh, so one of the primary, and one of the primary targets is broadcasters, right? I mean, they, people come after broadcasters. So security becomes a really big issue with IP uh, video networks. However, the Declan design eliminates this problem. That's because the ethernet connection is actually isolated from the computer. Um, the computer has no idea the ethernet connections here actually exist. Uh, the computer only knows about the Declan card. So video is loaded into the card's frame buffers, which are over here. And then the Declan card itself converts those frame buffers to 2110 IP video over the ethernet connections. Um, the frame buffers are sort of basically a video firewall. There's absolutely no communication uh, from the computer to the Ethernet socket. Uh, so no rogue software or hacking can get onto the 2110 IP network. I mean, you can always plug the computer Ethernet in if you want, but it doesn't really, there's no connection. It's completely isolated. So I think that's a really nice security benefit. Um, so I think these new cards will be very popular with broadcasters. So I'm getting back to the models uh, descriptions. So the Decklink IP HD model, which is this one here, is uh, 345. It's got the RJ45 Ethernet. Now the second model here is um, very similar. Uh, it's also three channels. It's Dec called Decklink IP um, HD Optical. It's the only difference is that 10G Ethernet is an optical fiber connection that comes with the module too. Now the Decklink IP HD Optical is 345. Now there's a third model which is a little different. Um, now we wanted a model that would plug into both IP and SDI systems. Um, so the Decklink IP slash SDI HD model has both Ethernet and 3G SDI connections. There's actually two um, 3G SDI connections because they can change direction. So you could assign them to like be both inputs or both outputs or one could be an input and one could be an output. Now this model only has two um, video playback and capture channels. Um, uh, but the card also has Genlock out down the bottom here. Um, that's used to lock to uh, external gear to the IP network. It's derived from the um, uh, PTP clock. Now the Decklink IP slash SDI HD card will be priced at 395. Now these three cards are currently in beta testing and we expect them to be shipping in a few months. Now the second thing we've got is we also have a new IP converter. Uh, this lets you convert 3G SDI equipment to 2110 IP broadcast based systems. Now it has uh, 10G Ethernet on it so it can support three input and three output channels in total at the same time. It, now it's called Blackmagic 2110 IP Converter 3 by 3G because it's three 3G channels. So you can see the front there, you can see it's got a really nice front uh, control panel. It's got an LCD that shows video, audio meters, and a timecode display. It also shows the Ethernet speeds. So you can check that it's actually running at 10G, which is you know, good from a diagnostic point of view. It's got some buttons to allow you to um, select which channel to view. Um, so you can just select between the three channels. And if you double press the button, it'll actually change between the input channels and the output channels, so you can switch over. Now the LCD's also got menus uh, for settings. Plus it's got some diagnostics and some simple router control on it as well. Now let me show you the back. Um, so you can see it there, if you can get a uh, bit of a view there. Um, <coughs> Now the rear has, I've also got a slide that I can put up. Now the rear um, panel has all the connections. Now it's got a built-in AC power supply, so you don't need those power bricks. Um, you just plug the AC cable in. It also powers over Ethernet, so that gives you redundant power if you use both Ethernet and the AC. In fact, you could just not, not even plug the um, AC and it would work off just power off Ethernet. Now it's got three, three G SDI inputs, and there's also loop outputs on those SDI inputs. Um, that helps if you're adding IP video into an existing system, so you can just loop through this converter and keep going off to switches and routers and things. It means you can have both the SDI and the IP systems running in parallel. Now the inputs also have frame sync, um, so they'll be retimed to the, uh, it'll retime the video inputs to the global PTP clock. Um, and a resync means that everything just works, which is fantastic if you've got a problem. But uh, there's also a reference output that's derived from the PTP clock, so you can use that reference output to lock the external gear, and then the resyncs will be bypassed. Um, so let me show you a bit of an example on how that would actually work. Um, so I've got a rack shelf here. Um, I've got a Hyperdeck Studio HD Plus in a universal rack shelf, uh, but I want to connect it to a, a 2110 IP system. So I can just add the converter in. So you can see it there. Now I can connect the inputs, outputs, and reference. Um, so let me show you on the back. So you can see it all fits in one rack unit. Um, there it is there. And you can see I've got my input, my output, and my reference plugged in. Now I've got two spare channels on the converter. You can see there's some spare sockets there. So I got an extra two of these hyperdecks. 
I can also loop the reference up through all the hyperdecks. So you can see really how many products you can have connected to your IP system through this one converter. And you can also see how easy it is. It's just very simple to plug in. There's no mess of like mini converters on the back of the rack with a, like a giant clutter. Um, you can just rack, rack, rack mount them right next to the gear that you're converting. Also, we get back around again. Now, if you put uh, three of these converters in a rack shelf, you actually get a total of nine channels in one rack unit, which is really nice. So we'll be showing this uh, 2110, the, sorry, we'll be showing the Blackmagic 2110 IP converter running in NAB. We'll also have it running with um, some software we've done on the smart control, on the VideoHub smart control, so we can use it for uh, routing control. Now we expect it to ship in a few months. Um, we'll do a bit of beta testing and the usual things like that. It'll be priced at $5.95, and it'll also include the front panel installed. Uh, we think that's uh, it's really important to have a front panel for an IP video device because it lets you access some routing and, and diagnostics from the front panel. But it also includes the setup utility, so you can do remote administration as well. Now we recently launched the new ATEM Television Studio HD range, and the early adopters have been really happy with them, so that's been really good. But we didn't launch a 4K model when we did that. That's because most streaming and broadcast is done in HD. However, we were working on a 4K model, and the 4K work's been progressing really well, and we wanted to show you uh, show it to you this at NEB this year. So you can see it over here. Uh, you can see it looks very similar. Um, basically, it's almost identical to the non-ISO HD model, but it has a joy uh, joystick here for moving the DVE around. Uh, all, the eight, uh, all eight inputs are now 12G SDI, so it handles all HD and Ultra HD formats up to 2160p60. Uh, each SDI input has a standards converter and a resync, um, so it handles non-standard video sources. Now, it also has the optional internal uh, storage for recording, but now it actually has faster 10G than it built in. That's because it's got to handle the higher Ultra HD data rates uh, now, so we've upgraded the uh, Ethernet. Now, the other big difference is it's got, um, uh, is the aux outputs. Now, the 4K model actually has 10 aux outputs in total, which sounds a little bit strange. It's actually more than the inputs, because um, the uh, HD model only had two aux outs. Um, but on the HD model, there was a dedicated, uh, what we had on the HD model was a dedicated program output above each input connector. And this is how we send the program video back to the cameras. And it's also important because we send the talkback tally and camera control back on that line as well. Um, but on this 4K model, all these eight outputs are now independent aux outs plus the other two as well. And there's a big reason for having so many aux outs. It's because we don't have an ISO model of the 4K design. You know, designing an ISO model of the 4K is a bit difficult because of the thermal issues and cost. So it's a tricky thing to do. Um, but these aux outputs actually solve that problem because you can connect them to external hyperdeck recorders um, and then you can send various inputs to those aux outputs. So for example, you could route input one to aux one and the hyperdeck connected to aux one would record input one. Um, and all the outputs are actually in sync and have matching time code, which means you can take all those recordings and put them into edit software for doing multicam editing. Uh, plus also you get the full audio mapping on all the, you know, so you can actually decide what audio sources go into the embedded audio outputs. And Hyperdeck Studio can record up to 16 audio channels with the video. Plus, of course, Hyperdeck Studio 4K Pros can record in H6.5, Pros, and DNX. So it's a very high quality solution. Um, and you only really pay for the ISO recording if you need it. You're only paying to record the inputs you need. Whereas obviously the ISO one, you get all eight, and it, it costs, there's a price jump for that. Um, so I think this is a really good solution for ISO recording on, an ISO, on a non-ISO switcher in 4K. Otherwise, this 4K model is basically very similar to the HD models. So I don't really need to demo it because, you know, we um, already did that on the previous launch uh, a month ago. But we'll have it on the booth at NEB and you'll be able to see it. Now, the new ATEM Television Studio 4K8 will be priced at uh, 4, uh, sorry, 4595. And it should be available in June or July, probably July, because it's a pretty complex product and it takes longer to test. And you can come along and see it at the show. Now, we've also been working on a 4K model of the ATEM 4ME Constellation. Um, it's called ATEM 4ME Constellation 4K. It's exactly the same as the HD model. Um, it's just now in Ultra HD. So it has uh, four independent mix effects rows. It's got 40, 12 GSDI inputs. It supports HD and Ultra HD up to 2160p60. All the inputs have standards converters. There's 24, 12 GSDI aux outputs. The USB webcam uh, features is in there, like the HD models have. You know, the USB webcam, it tricks a computer into thinking that the USB is a webcam. So you can stream into a into a computer, um, but it's down converted to HD. Uh, most webcam software supports HD, so that's just HD. Um, it's got 16 upstream advanced chroma keys. There's four per row. Uh, four, sorry, four per ME. Uh, it's got four downstream keys. It's got four ultra HD media players, and the media pool supports both uh, stills and clips. It's got two super source processors. 
Now each super source processor is eight, it's got eight DVE, sorry, across the two super source processors. Um, so that's, you can do input compositions with up to four DVEs in the background, and that comes in as the input, and there's two of those. Plus the switcher has actually four independent DVEs as well. It's got the built-in talkback and the head connection, uh, set connections on a front panel, but it also connects to external talkback systems via the RJ45 connector on the back. Um, the front panel can also control the switcher. It's got a really large LCD with menus. Um, you can see this is a very powerful switcher. It's identical to the HD model in everything, but it's now Ultra HD. And you can also obviously add a range of um, ATEM advanced panels. There's different sizes depending on how, how you're gonna use the switcher. It also works with products like the WebResenter 4K for 4K streaming. You can add a HyperDeck uh, Studio 4K Pro for master recording or a bunch of them for ISO recording because it's got all the aux outs. So it's a very powerful model. Now uh, the new ATEM 4ME Constellation 4K will be priced at 8995 and it should be available in around June. And we'll also be showing this switcher on the booth at NEB as well. It's an amazingly powerful switcher. We're also announcing an update to DaVinci Resolve at NEB. It's called DaVinci Resolve 18.5. Now there's so many updates that we've actually recorded a video to show you. So let me play that video to you now. DaVinci Resolve 18.5 introduces exciting new tools designed to speed up your workflows and change how you approach your projects. There are a number of new AI tools when working in the studio version. You can now automatically transcribe audio in your media for text-based editing and in your timeline for instant subtitles. It's so easy. Simply select one or more clips in your media pool and then right-click and choose Transcribe Audio. The resulting dialog window will allow you to search for specific terms or jump to the section of the clip where a word appears. Mark in and out ranges and then insert or append edits directly to the timeline. This could save you a lot of time when editing. Instead of listening to entire scenes or interviews, you can use the transcribe feature to quickly locate the topic you want the edit to focus on. Use the auto caption feature to automatically generate subtitles on the timeline. Create a subtitle track, and in the timeline menu, click Create Subtitles from Audio. Upon analysis, the transcribed audio will populate the track. Click the individual captions to modify them in the inspector. In the DaVinci Resolve Studio version, you can now use AI to classify audio clips based on their content, dialogue, effects, or music. To perform the analysis, select the audio clips, right-click, and choose Audio Classification Analyze. When finished, the clip's audio category parameter will reflect their classification. Beneath, the subcategory will assign additional keywords based on content. Open the new collections bins in the media pool to navigate audio clips based on their categories. The DaVinci Neural Engine Superscale, which is an AI processor, now has a new 2x enhanced mode for extremely high quality output when upscaling in studio. When selected, sharpness and noise reduction parameters allow you to further refine the upscale. As well as the clip attributes, you can now find the Superscale settings in the Inspector panel. The cut page has seen multiple improvements, from its interface and operation to the introduction of new tools. You can now create split edits simply by doing a roll edit at the lower part of a clip. The cursor will show an audio icon, which indicates it will roll the edit for audio only. This is a very fast way to create split edits. You can also increase the size of the audio track, which makes adding split edits easier because the audio track is larger. When the audio track is enlarged, the audio is displayed unrectified. The biggest changes are the addition of new menus to the left of the timeline. These are called timeline options, timeline actions, and edit actions. A lot of new features have been added into these menus. Plus, the video only and audio only controls have now been repositioned to the lower left of the media pool to free up space, while the most important timeline features are now positioned to the left of the timeline. One of these features is a new ripple button that enables and disables rippled edits. In the past, the cut page always rippled edits, which means timeline clips would move with an edit point when a clip was trimmed. Now, with the ripple button disabled, when you trim a clip, the duration of the edit will be preserved, and you can introduce gaps in the timeline. By default, ripple is enabled. However, a great shortcut is to hold the Option or Alt key when doing an edit to disable rippling for that edit only. The Timeline Options menu is where you change settings that affect the view of the timeline. A good example is the ability to display clip names and status on the clips for quick reference. The Timeline Options menu is also the new location for timeline settings such as snapping, trim to audio, fixed playhead, and boring detector. 
This ensures that the main user interface has more space for controls that are used more often when editing. The Timeline Actions menu is for performing functions on the timeline, such as adding video, audio, and subtitle tracks. This menu also lets you automatically generate subtitles without leaving the cup page. Simply click Create Subtitles from Audio. Plus, in DaVinci Resolve Studio, you can now perform DaVinci Neural Engine scene cut detection directly on the timeline. Other features in the Timeline Actions menu are options for adding markers to the timeline and to set the default marker color. The new Edit Action menu has a new feature to trim the start or end of a clip to the current position of the playhead. When combined with the ripple toggle, you can perform this action over media or a gap in the timeline. Another action allows you to quickly resync timeline video and audio clips. The Smooth Cut button in the Transition buttons has now been changed to a menu, so you can select other transition types. That means that you can right-click the menu to see your favorites. Once selected, the button will now change to that transition type and you can use it again just by clicking the button. The Quick Export window now includes updates for uploading vertical aspect ratio edits directly to TikTok. This makes it possible to post cinematic quality color graded videos quickly. When editing with a keyboard, sometimes the smart indicator above the timeline was hard to see. Now, the automatic edit point has improved highlighting so it's easier to see which edit point will be affected when you trim or insert clips. In the Edit page, when flattening a multicam clip, all color grades and effects will now be transferred to the underlying camera angles, preserving all the changes made to the clips in the color page. You can now use keyboard shortcuts to add and delete keyframes to video and audio parameters. Additionally, you can now modify keyframes during playback for even faster review. The Fusion page now supports universal scene descriptor files. The USD framework is a set of open 3D scene standards that encourages collaboration between artists, animators, and compositors. Fusion now supports importing USD data including geometry, lighting, cameras, materials, and animation. A new collection of USD tools has been added to allow users to manipulate, relight, and render these USD files with the help of Hydra-based renderers such as Storm. Use the multi-merge node to composite and manage multiple foreground layers. In the inspector, you can customize the layering and toggle visibility. Each layer has its own controls, so you can still change individual properties like position, size, and apply modes. In the color management project settings, you can now choose whether to enable or disable tone mapping for fusion conversions. This can help solve unexpected tonal shifts that can occur between fusion and the other resolve pages in wider gamut projects. In Studio, the native AI-based depth map tool is now supported in Fusion. Resolve color management can now be configured on a timeline level. Use the Timeline Settings panel to set a timeline's independent color properties for projects with mixed media. Corrector nodes in the Color Page Node Editor now feature composite modes. These will allow you to affect how node values blend into the pipeline without the need of a layer mixer. When working with color space transform nodes, you can now quickly swap the input and output color space and gamma parameters. The color page viewer now supports marker overlays and annotations for timeline and clip markers. Clips with missing lookup tables will now feature an overlay in the bottom right of the viewer to indicate the name of a missing LUT or state that multiple LUTs are missing. In addition to this, the LUT gallery will display a missing LUTs tab which allows you to see and manage missing LUTs. The new DaVinci Neural Engine powered Relight effect allows you to introduce virtual light sources into a scene with realistic surface highlights and fall off. First, drag the Relight effect onto a corrector node to generate a surface map. Add another instance of the Relight node to light the scene based on this map. Drag the Point Source Viewer overlay to change the position of the virtual light in real time. Use the parameters in the settings to determine the light and surface properties. With the Relight map in place, you can now use the standard grading tools in the color page to relight the scene. There are two other light properties. Use Directional to cast a broad light in a single direction. This is ideal for changing the time of day by imitating the behavior of natural light. You can also use the Spotlight to cast a light onto a location, complete with cone and drop-off controls. The Relight effect is further optimized when used together with other secondary grading tools. Use Windows to limit the area that the artificial light affects. Or Magic Masks to focus the light on a single person or object. In the Fairlight page, 
you can now create, edit, and mix groups to combine related audio tracks. To create a group, open the Index panel and click the New Group icon. Select the attributes you'd like the tracks to share and assign group members. Enable the group in the panel and start making changes to affect all the assigned tracks. Use the Groups panel to temporarily suspend groups, allowing you to change the focus of your actions from broader groups to smaller nested groups. Activate all groups at the top or deactivate to focus on individual tracks. In the Edit timeline, you can draw or edit automation across multiple group tracks at once. Groups also support editing operations, like moving or trimming audio clips. When using Elastic Wave to retime audio clips, so This is the launch button. That's what we control in the start, how much power we want. The new voice option offers natural sounding, high quality results when changing the speed of dialogue. So this is the launch button. That's what we control in the start, how much power we want. And there have been many improvements made to Dolby Atmos monitoring, including the addition of 9.16 and 5.14 formats and support for personalized HRTF binaural rendering. Other additions include Atmos re-render capabilities, 5.1-based real-time loudness metering, and 96 kHz master file support. In the Deliver page, TikTok has now been added as a render preset. To automatically upload videos upon render, first go to Preferences to sign into your TikTok account, and in the Render Settings panel, click Upload Directly to TikTok. You can also export to TikTok using the Quick Export dialog. When using Dropbox Replay, you can now upload new versions of a timeline and link them to an existing video upload. It is now possible to render GIF, JPEG, and PNG image sequences. On top of that, you may also render out animated GIF clips. It is now also possible to import and export timelines using the Open Timeline I.O. format. And you can now more quickly back up your work by enabling timeline backups in the user preferences. Modified timelines will automatically be backed up locally for both collaborative and non-collaborative projects on local, network, and cloud project libraries. DaVinci Resolve 18.5 features a number of remote monitoring improvements. You can now initiate remote monitoring connections using just a Blackmagic ID and a session code. This means clients will no longer be dealing with IP addresses and port forwarding. And in Studio, you'll be able to stream to multiple clients simultaneously, who will be able to view your output using the native video players on their computer displays. You can even remotely monitor on an iPad or iPhone. With DaVinci Resolve 18.5, you can also export your timeline to Presentations. Simply select File, Quick Export, then Presentations, and log into Blackmagic Cloud to export your video. With Presentations, Multiple people can review your timeline, make comments, and even share a live chat with others who are reviewing too. This was an overview of just some of the many new features in DaVinci Resolve 18.5. Thank you for watching. So you can see it's got a lot of powerful new features. Now DaVinci Resolve 18.5 will be available free of charge, and DaVinci Resolve 18.5 uh, Studio will also be free, uh, free update for people who've, who own that. Uh, now the public beta is a public beta and it'll be available later today for download. We'll also be showing it on the NEB booth. Um, we'll also be demonstrating how it works with Blackmagic Cloud for shared projects and some of the cloud storage as well. Um, now we also, another thing we have this year is we've got some updated software for the pocket cinema cameras. It has support for vertical aspect ratio shooting. It means you can create cinematic content for TikTok and YouTube shorts and things like that. You can simply rotate the camera vertically for nine by 16 shooting and the heads up display automatically rotates. Um, you can even use uh, vertical frame guides and safe area markers on the LCD. Now, let me show you. So I'll bring it in here so you can see if you can get a bit of a shot there. See there? So that's horizontal. But if I rotate it vertically, you can see the heads up display changes. You see the, the settings in, are there. And then I can record vertically. It's very simple. So it's cool. Um, it even rotates all the way around, check this out. So if you mounted it on a rig or something upside down using attachment points, it'll actually work upside down. And you can get a shot of that there, you see that? So it just changes as you rotate it. It's pretty cool. Um, so the good thing about that, of course, is it handles both left and right-handed depending which way you around you rotate it. Now the files will automatically be tagged with metadata. So the files will just display vertically in DaVinci Resolve. There's also some project settings in DaVinci Resolve for vertical aspect ratio edits. Uh, and DaVinci Resolve 18.5 can also direct upload to YouTube or TikTok. Um, 
And you can also lock the camera, the rotation of the camera, so it won't rotate if you don't want it to do that. Now this uh, Blackmagic Camera R8.1 update should be posted later today. It's a free download, so you can just download it free of charge. Then you can start shooting vertically with the cinema, you know, with cinema quality. So it's a really nice update. Now another thing we'll be showing at, the, uh, at NEB is a ENG kit for the Ursa Broadcast G2. In fact, the Ursa Broadcast, uh, the original one as well. Now it includes a better mic mount, better light mount, and also a, a transmitter mount. There's a whole bunch of things on here. Um, it's got a shield to protect the uh, cooling of the camera. So like if you're covering a fire and there's water spray everywhere, it'll protect the uh, electronics. So it's, a, it's quite a nice kit. Uh, we'll be showing it better at the show. Someone stole the light and the transmitter off this camera. It's actually on the booth at the show. So that's uh, not as good as we can show. The one at the, at the show will look better than this. Um, but uh, come and check it out and yeah, we can have a discussion about how it all works and which bits go on and you'll see it there at the show. Um, so I'll get this out of the way. Uh, but I wanted to mention that even though all the bits have been stolen. Now another thing, we've got an update to Ursa, Bro uh, sorry, Ursa Mini Pro 12K at the show. Um, I'll bring it in. Um, now it's an alternative model of, of, of camera. So it's basically a new model that adds a low pass filter. Now the 12K sensor captures in incredible detail, but shooting in 12K on very sharp lenses can you know, expose some aliasing artifacts. So the new model has the optical filter which will hand, handle fine detail better, especially with modern, really modern sharp lenses. Um, now the filter is a custom design that matches the 12K sensor. It preserves all the detail and color while suppressing more A and, and aliasing. Um, now Blackmagic RAW has also been updated to handle these new 12K files with the optical filter because of some difference, differences. Um, the model also has uh, improved IR filtering to better handle uh, far red color response. Uh, and the new model um, really is design and it's fantastic for virtual production with the big LED video walls. Uh, but however, not everyone wants the filter. So we'll actually have two models of this camera, the new model uh, with the filter and the existing one without the filter. And you can choose which one you need. Now the new Blackmagic Ursa Mini Pro 12K OLPF will be priced at 6385. And that's the same price as the model without the filter. And the new model's available now. Now, one other thing I wanna mention, um, there's two things left. Uh, I want to talk about film scanning. Now we've continued to work on Cintel film scanner updates. We've been working hard to support eight millimeter film and we'll have that shipping later in the year. But we wanted to talk about it with Cintel owners at the show. Um, so all the Cintel caps and drive scanners will support eight millimeter film. You only add to, need to add some eight millimeter skid plates. So we'll have two new skid plates, one for regular eight millimeter film and the other one for super eight film. And we'll also include some special platters to support the eight millimeter film spools. Uh, now the audio and key code reader don't, doesn't work for 8mm film, but we are planning to work on some decoding the optical audio in the gate like we do for the other standards. Um, we we'll still have a bit more work to do on the 8mm support, but we wanted to have some conversations with the people who need 8mm film support at the show. And we've been asked a lot about it. I think every show everyone asks about 8mm film. So we'll be showing 8mm film scanning at NEB. Uh, plus we've also actually been working on some software that's independent of that for all Cintel film scanners has improved black and white film support. People have been asking for pure black and white support, so we've added that. And there's some new black and white film types in the menu in DaVinci for selecting black and white film. Um, and you can just select that and get improved results. So please come by and check that out as well. Now we expect this software to be available soon and it'll be free of charge. So the last product I'd like to show is uh, new storage. Now we launched the Blackmagic Cloud Pod about a year ago and it's been really great. It turns any USB disk into network storage and it also seems to Dropbox and Google Drive so you can sync your media globally. However, we wanted a rack mount solution and we've developed that. Um, it's called Blackmagic Cloud Dock. It's similar uh, to our multi-dock, but it connects with 10G Ethernet. Uh, and also it works with both SSDs and U.2 disks, so it's faster. It has a much more, you know, a nicer, more modern design. You can see them here. Um, now there's two of them. There's a two bay one, which is called Blackmagic Cloud Dock 2 and it supports up to two disks. And then there's a, the lower one here is called Blackmagic Cloud Dock 4 and it handles four disks. Now let me uh, rotate them around, you can see the rear. Um, oops, try not to drop them. Um, now you can see the both models have 10G Ethernet switches built in. The two bay one has uh, two Ethernet, uh, 10G Ethernet uh, connections on the back. And the four bay one on the bottom has four 10G Ethernet connections on the back. So it makes it great for DOT carts on sets and things like that. You can plug all your media in and then share it amongst all the computers that you have on set, like for color grading and things like that. Now I've got a Blackmagic Cloud Dog 4 in the rack here. You can see the rack and it's connected to three Hyperdeck Extreme recorders. And so I can just connect them uh, directly to the Cloud Dock for network recording. Um, plus the Cloud Docks have the nice fun monitoring HDMI output, which we've been putting on our storage. 
and I've connected it to the Smart View 4K at the top of the rack. Um, so you can see the Cloud Dock status. Um, so you can see that up the top there. Now it shows all the disks, um, but they're all mounted independently. Um, but you can see them all combined on the on the memory map there. So let me do a recording and I'll actually show you recording into the single disk. So I'll just come over here. So if I start recording on the Hyperdex, there we are there, um, you can see that the data is going to all the Hyperdex there. Uh, sorry, the, hyper, the data is going from each one of these Hyperdex into the different inputs because I've plugged each Hyperdex into the, into the cloud dock there and they're all recording onto that one disk. Um, so what that means is you can actually share these disks with computers even while you're recording. There's a fourth um, port that you can have computer, you know, plugged in with uh, computers doing color grading or you know, syncing media uh, while you're actually recording at the same time. So that's really cool. I'll go back to the other side. Um, so the new Blackmagic Cloud Dock 2 will be priced at $555. Uh, the new uh, Blackmagic Cloud Dock 4 will be priced at $1395. And they should be available in a month or two, um, depending on parts supply. Now these are extremely high performance. They're, you know, they're not low-end products at all. They're designed for high-end film and television use. They also support the Dropbox and Google Drive, so you can sync your um, SSD and U.2 disks to, to Dropbox, so you can share the media globally. I think they're really exciting, and I think they look great in a rack. They're really nice looking. So anyway, that's about all for this NAB update. Um, I hope you can come by the NAB show and, and see these new products working. Um, there's a lot to, to see. Uh, anyway, thanks for watching, and if you're traveling to Las Vegas, you know, please travel safely. Take care and bye.